from a large flat rock overlooking a valley floor in the wilds of Midian. And if you want to know where the wilds of Midian are, think of the middle of present-day Saudi Arabia. Moses watched as the night was overtaken by morning shadows and a solitary figure sitting out on this rock watching the sun come up. He is overqualified. He's the most overqualified shepherd to ever follow sheep around those Midianite valleys. He's working for his father-in-law, and I guess that can be a real good thing, or possibly that could be a real bad thing. But he's working for his father-in-law. He's in a dead-end job. And he's living a thankfully forgotten life. He, I say thankfully forgotten because, believe me, Moses wanted to be forgotten. Moses wanted to be off the radar. Moses was a fugitive. Talk about unmet expectations. Talk about a life that just wasn't working out. Moses was born to be a deliverer, born for that purpose, born to deliver the people of God. He was educated, highly educated, to be a deliverer. He was positioned by God to be a deliverer. And then it all blew up. It all fell apart. And now Moses cloaks himself in anonymity. He's a fugitive. He's an 80-year-old castaway. In Exodus 3, he's the poster child for everybody who ever missed their big chance. He's the poster child for everyone who missed their moment. He made his big move, and he got stuffed. He tried to change the course of human history, and history just laughed him right off the stage. He sold himself as the next great deliverer, the next big thing, and no one was buying. No one even bid. Once an Egyptian prince... He was now little more than a Bedouin shepherd. Once he was the great hope of a nation, now he is the protector of bleeding sheep. He had tried to rally the Jewish slave state to revolt against Egypt and follow him to the promised land. This is what God had called him to do. He he tried his best, and the people had rejected him and treated him with utter contempt And Acts, Luke in Acts chapter 5 just gives us, or Acts chapter 7 gives us a little bit of insight. He says in verse 25, For he supposed his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. And they did not understand. He supposed. Anyone here ever got in trouble over supposition? Expectations? A false self-image? Hopes and dreams that weren't tethered to anything whatsoever. You supposed. Well, Moses supposed that his brethren would understand that God had called them. And when he, when he took the moment and seized the moment and killed the Egyptian, he expected he was going to get s- some support. And no one was there trying to do the right thing. He, he killed a man and then had to run for his life. He alienated everyone. He alienated his Hebrew family. He became an enemy to his adopted Egyptian household. And now he is attached to a Midianite family, scratching out a living among the lowly. Nobody could stand with him, or no one would stand with him when he killed the Egyptian slave master. So he did what desperate and shamed men have been doing. Since time began, he disappeared. He disappeared. And it was one thing that Moses proved to be really good at. Disappearing. I wouldn't be good at disappearing. I'm somewhat gregarious. I'm a little bit on the outgoing side. I'm a little bit of an A-type. And for me to live completely hidden under the radar, that would be really difficult for me. And it seems like that's who Moses was. But he's a different person now. And we'll see it in a moment. He's a different person now. He wants to live under the radar. Have you ever thought what it would be like to just disappear? 
you ever wanted to just walk away from the mess, walk away from the stress, walk away from the, the trouble, get on a plane, go somewhere, leave no record whatsoever, no trace. All you would have on you is the account to the, uh, or the, the number for the account that you have in the Cayman Islands with a hundred million dollars in it. And you would just, you would be a vagabond in the world and you would just wander. I would be really good at that for about a week. And I'm just not wired that way, but man, Moses, Moses wanted to live that way, and he proved himself really good at disappearing. Egypt, you know Egypt was hunting him for a while until that pharaoh finally died. They were looking for, they were looking for Moses. He was a fugitive, but they never found him because for 40 years he lived completely off the grid in the outback of Sinai. And there he married and had a son. He gave up on his calling. He gave up on his people. He gave up on his dreams. That's what you do when everything blows up. You keep your head down and you make a living and you forget about your roots and you try and go on and carve out something new. And then on one morning, that morning when the sun was barely risen, sitting on a flat rock looking out over an empty valley, he saw a bush that was burning and yet it would not be consumed and it captured his imagination it captured his attention and he made his way across the valley floor to look a, a little bit closer and as he drew near God spoke out of the fire and he put Moses back in the deliverance business and it should have been simple it should have been simple after all an audible voice from God speaks and says, go, what are you going to do? Anyone? Suppose this morning you're afraid to answer. I understand. That's okay. It's okay. S suppose that you woke up this morning, you look around the room and you realize I am fully awake. I haven't moved from one dream state to another dream state. I am awake. I'm alert your alarm clock falls off a table or something. You are wide awake. And suddenly, and suddenly, this voice says, Bob. Bob. I want you to get in your car. Get in your car now. What are you waiting for, Bob? I want you to go to Starbucks, and I want you to order a quad venti, one sweet and low, no foam. That's the voice of the Lord to me sometimes in the morning. But I don't think it was the Lord, and I know it wasn't an audible voice. I'll tell you this, if it was an audible voice, I'd peel out of bed, pull on my sweats, I'd be in my car, and I'd be standing in line at Starbucks. I would elbow people out of the way until they gave me my drink, because when I got the drink, I know that in that moment, God was going to say something to me, because he wouldn't have sent me there unless he was going. An audible voice is a motivator, isn't it? You would think that Moses would hear this audible voice and... He would say, I'm on, I'm on top of it. I'm ready to roll. Let's go. But there's so much more to the story than that. His life on the run had changed him. And kneeling probably even prostrate in front of that burning bush, his objections came fast and furious. Who am I? Now, when your confidence has been deeply shaken, that's the question. Who am I? What do I say? What if they won't listen? I don't have the gifts. And finally, oh, couldn't you please just send someone else? In our day, we might add some other excuses like, I don't have the time. How about this? I'm too old for this. Can I suggest a few more? I tried that once. I got beat up. I'm not doing that again. Or this one. It's not really fair for you to ask me to do this. There are entire messages to be preached on each of Moses' objections. I find his third objection the most revealing, and we're going to spend our time there this morning. What if they won't Listen. God, what if they won't listen to me when I go back to Egypt? And from Exodus 4, 
And Moses answered, But behold, they'll not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. teaching points from this poignant story. First of all, God never calls you to a task that fits. He calls you to something bigger than you are. He will never call you to a task that fits. Watch out when the opportunity just seems to be tailor-made and you know you got all the goods. For when you move in to fulfill whatever that thing is, you will trust in your own understanding and not in the Lord's. God always puts us in circumstances that are over our heads, in water that is a little bit too deep. He will always put us in a place where we must trust Him by making the task bigger than we are. There must be a little bit of impossible in every commission that God offers. He also calls us to that which requires faith in Him alone. Moses knew that the task was bigger than he was. He had already tried and he had already failed. And in the meantime, he had completely lost his self-confidence. Once again, Acts chapter 7, Luke gives us insight, being 2,000 years closer to the story, Luke gives us insight. The Jews were aware of these traditions, and he offers it to us. He says in chapter 7, verse 22 of Acts, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. Luke says... Moses was mighty in words and deeds, and yet, now after, Lu or after Moses has, has left Egypt and lived in the Midianite wilderness and taken on the life of a Bedouin, no longer walking as a prince or living within the boundaries of his calling, and now we hear from Moses, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. What's happened to this man. It's not a bad thing to be facing a Moses-sized challenge. As a matter of fact, if you're not facing that kind of challenge, you just might slump into mediocrity. Maintenance, living a life of maintenance, often hinders developing a life of deliverance, developing a life that is pushing the boundaries, developing a life that is pleasing to God, developing a life that chases after visions and dreams. Living a life of maintenance often locks us in to a life that is devoid of the presence and the power of God. The level of one's competence is often a level void of the miraculous. God always calls us to a task that exceeds our abilities. Second, when God calls, you start with what you have. The Lord said, what is that in your hand? A staff, he said. What's in your hand? God wants to start with you with what you've got. God always starts with where you are. This is why you need to be faithful to the Lord even if you're in a dark place. Be faithful to the Lord even if you feel like you're right up against the, the wall. Be faithful to the Lord if you feel like you're not being used according to your abilities or finding your strengths. Find some place, serve, live for the Lord, walk in, in faith before Him, give Him your heart, do what, is, do what is right. God always starts where you are. 
Why not be ready through obedience, be ready for the moment that he moves you to a new place or a greater opportunity or expanded responsibilities? God always starts with where you are. And if you despise the place where you are, you will miss the calling of the Lord that will take you to the place you want to be. What is in your hand? It's easy to find fault, and it's easy to depreciate the gifts of God. All you need is a little bit of complacency. I hit a a place not so long ago where I was listing all of the problems and all of the things, not listing them on paper, but listing them in my mind. Here are all all the problems, all of the challenges, all of the uphill struggles, all of the frustrations, all of the things that I could not fix. I was talking about the church. I was thinking about myself. I was looking at my family. I was looking at vision long term. I was taking all of these things together. And believe me, one was just flowing into the other. Before long, I was totally bummed out. You ever looked at your life and been bummed out? Is it just me? I feel like the biggest loser in the room. Have you ever felt that way? You just look at it and you say, I should be more than this. I should have achieved more than this. My life shouldn't look this way. I should have reached this level. I should have got this done. This is where I should be by now, but I'm not there and I'm frustrated by it. You make those lists and before long, you will live. You will live in the spirit of those lists rather than a, than a spirit of faith and a spirit of hope, rather than looking for God on the horizon, you will be looking at all of the stuff you've left on the path. God asks to you, what do you have in your hand? So I got so thoroughly disgusted with myself that I sat down and decided that I would begin to write out, this time with a yellow pad, I would just begin to write out all the goodness of God. And I started started writing all of the good things that God has done in my life. Do you know that, that my wife is still with me after all these years? It's an amazing thing. I know I can't figure it out either. It's absolutely beyond me and you. It's something that we share together, an absolute sense of, stupefaction as to why this woman would live with me for all of these years but she she does and gladly and that's what really blows my mind and did you know that that uh, all three of my all three of my children and my two sons-in-law are serving the lord i can stop right there i can cast the rest of the list aside because some of you will testify that would mean everything three incredible grandchildren and a fourth on the way. Calvary Church is a wonderful church. It's a blessed place. It's an incredible collection of people. Even as it morphs and it changes and God is just moving in his way and he's he's creating and recreating and and renewing and it's a wonderful place and God has blessed me to live just in Greensboro. I started writing these things down. The more I started writing these things down, the more that other list just began to fade out of view. Have you stopped to, well, the old timers knew it. Well, they used to sing a song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. How long has it been since you counted your blessings? What's in your hand? Moses, what's in your hand? It's a staff. It's just a shepherd's staff. It's a stick. It wasn't a five-point plan for the destabilization of the government in Egypt. It wasn't a detailed map outlining the fastest route to get back to Egypt. It wasn't a letter of recommendation to the elders of Israel. It wasn't a doctorate. It wasn't a declaration. It wasn't a strategy. It wasn't a stock fund. It was a stick. You got more in your hands than Moses. Moses, what do you got? I got a stick. That staff began as a branch on some windswept hillside just, just a branch on a tree until Moses hacked that thing down and 
dried it out and polished it up and started walking by its aid. It was just a dead thing. What's in your hand? Well, what in my, what, what's in my hand, Lord? Well, it's dead. That's all Moses had, just that staff. He used it for everything. He used it for everything from crushing scorpions to nudging sheep to scraping out a fire ring or pointing in the direction that he wanted to go. It held little value except it was worn smooth and it was just the right height and he'd walked with it for quite a while. And if it were to suddenly break or if he went to sleep and had left the tip near the fire and that thing had burned up, Moses simply would have cut another one off another tree someplace. It was just, it was just a stick. Moses was in a full-blown midlife crisis. 80 in Moses' life, a span of 120 years, is, is about 50 in a lifespan today. Moses couldn't see himself as a deliverer. Here he is at midlife and nothing was happening. He couldn't see a path that would lead an 80-year-old shepherd in the middle of the Arabian desert to somehow walk the corridors of power of Egypt. All Moses could see was his own inadequacy. And that is where we all begin by recognizing, what do you have? Not much. You see, it's not in us and it's not of us when God chooses to use us he's very much like Moses hacking off a limb from a tree that was at the core by the way of Jesus teaching to his disciples when he said I'm the vine you're the branches he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing what's in your hand Moses what do you have stick the staff and he said throw it to the ground so he threw it to the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it there was no one to see this except the sheep which tells me Moses must have enjoyed telling the story a little bit later in life I wonder if just sitting around with the family, they would ask him, Papa Moses, tell us about the snake again. I wonder if it didn't send the kids into convulsions of laughter. As Moses told the story of casting that rod down on the ground and it turned into a snake, I can hear it all. There's a third teaching point in all of this. Anything he might use must first be given. What's in your hand? A stick, a staff. And God said, throw it down. Let it go. Release it. If God can use a stick supernaturally, nothing more than a dead, dry stick, God can use anything we hold in our hands, but not so long as we hold it in our hands got my talents, got my degrees, got my books, got my abilities, got my track record, got all, I'm holding them tight and God says, throw them down. You want me to use those things? Stop holding on to them possessively, stop depending on them and trusting in them. You want me to use those things? You've got to release them. Throw it down. If you'll use it, it must be surrendered. You want God to use your talent? You've got to throw it down. You've got to lay it down. You want God to use your great learning, your wisdom? You think you have a gifting? That gift in your hand must first be fully surrendered back to God or else the power rests in us alone. We'll hold it and it will come to nothing. There's... A reason that financial blessing stubbornly refuses to flow into some people's lives. It's because in so many cases, first, they will not give. They won't give, and yet they expect to receive. Most of us know that if you want to harvest, you have to plant. Most of us know that you shouldn't expect your ship to come in if you never sent your ship out. If you don't sow, you don't reap. 
We want God to pay our bills, but we won't pay his tithe. We hold it in our hands. The Lord said, what's in your hands? Well, it's my money. This is going to get convicting. And the Lord says, is it your money? Yes, it is. Is it really? Isn't everything we have the Lord's? Well, it's, it's yours, but you made me a steward over it. Good, I'm glad we understand that. So you are a steward of my money. Yeah, 10% of that I expect to be distributed into the work of the kingdom of God. Yeah, but it's mine. No, you already agreed that it's mine and that you are a steward. Are you a good steward or a bad steward? Are you sowing or are you expecting a harvest without release? Do you want me to pay your bills and you don't pay your tithe? Read the book of Malachi and you'll see how the Lord responds on these issues. There is an economy that God works in us. There is an economy that God works through us. But it will be only a mystery and a wish for you until, until you cast it down. Until you say, Lord, it's yours. So I'll walk in obedience with it. Not only will I give the tithe, which is yours, pay the tithe. I will also give offerings. I'll respond anytime you prompt me. If I get even the inkling that I should release money and trust you to do something with it or to bless someone, I'll do it. I'll not expect any, any type of a claim for it. I don't want the left hand to know it. I'll do it biblically, and I will expect that you will meet all of my needs according to your riches and glory. How many of you know that scripture? And my God shall supply all your need according to the riches and glory. Do you know the context of it? If you look at it, the context of that text in the scripture is all about them giving generously to a need. And yet people run all over the place saying, well, look, we just believe that my God's going to supply all of our need. Isn't that the promise? It's the promise to those who give. Otherwise, you just hold on to what you have. And watch it seep through your fingers. So he cast it on the ground. He let it go. He cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. You see, Moses didn't get a preview of what God was going to do with that rod. Anything you give to God, you truly must give to him without qualification so lord i'm going to serve but i expect this is what's going to happen lord i'll go but i expect this is what's going to lord i'm going to cast this rod down and i expect that this rod will i don't know bud or do something but i'm going to cast this rod down i wasn't expecting a snake Whatever you release, whatever you let go, you have to trust the Lord in what he does. Moses had no idea that God would make that rod a snake. He ran from it. He had no idea that God would use that rod as an instrument through which plagues began to fall in Egypt. He had no idea that God would use that rod that he was casting down. One day he would use that rod as Moses extended it to part the Red Sea. God doesn't tell us what he might do with what we surrender to him. We follow after vision. We follow after longing. We follow after a sense of this is what I think I should do. We do all of these things in good faith. But please understand, he has full authority to do whatever he wants to do with your life. I'm a pastor. I've always been a pastor. I believe I'll always be a pastor. I believe that's what God has called me to. And every once in a while, I start thinking as though I've got it all figured out. This is what I am to do. But I have to keep my heart open. Even though there's nothing else that turns my crank, nothing else I would ever want to do as far as I know. And I keep telling God, this is who I am, right? But if your life is surrendered to him when he calls you move when he says do this you do that and he does not always tell you where he's leading you he does not always tell you how it's going to work out you take the next step and he will bless it but anything he will use must first be given to him 
and there may be some surprises along the way. How many of you can testify? I remember when I took a step and I began to follow the Lord and all of a sudden all hell broke loose. I said yes to God and man, all kinds of stuff started shaking up out there and I couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. I don't say this to discourage anyone. And this is not a rule. If you follow God, all of a sudden everything will go wrong in your life. There are people who honestly don't follow God because they know if they do, the devil's going to bring extreme oppression and they would rather live as somewhat of a friend of the devil. Follow the logic. It's not rocket science. Follow the logic. Well, I don't want to do anything that would stir the devil up. I don't want to obey the Lord because that might draw attention to me from, from evil forces out there. So rather, I will live in, I'll live in a state of detente with the devil. Rapprochement. We'll just, he'll dwell on his side, I'll dwell on my, uh, on my side. Try factoring that into the warrior motif that we find throughout the Bible and especially in Paul's writing about putting on the whole armor of God and taking your stand against the enemy and wielding the sword of the Spirit. You'll find that it falls kind of lame, but a lot of people, a lot of people think that way. I'm not sure I want to stir up the devil. I want to give him a headache. God doesn't always tell you what he's going to do. He doesn't always show you what it's going to be like. He simply calls us to cast it down, to give it to him, to lay it aside. And sometimes there's a few surprises along the way. A snake, a serpent, Moses fled. There's a fourth teaching point in all of this. Any act of obedience will be tested. Any act of obedience will be tested. The Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And if I were writing the text, I would have said, and Moses said, are you out of your mind? And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand again. I've watched enough of the National Geographic channel. That channel will keep you up at night. I watched a thing on these guys who crawl into snake holes after these giant pythons and pull them out. These people have no brains whatsoever. I am almost certain that the, 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 the frontal cortex is completely missing. First of all, snake hole like that, I'm not getting anywhere near it. And when I see the circumference of that snake, I can tell you for sure I'm going to keep my distance. I don't, I'm not touching the thing. People come up, why don't you touch this snake? you want to touch this snake? No, I really don't. I don't want to touch your snake. I don't want to pet your cobra. I mean, I have absolutely, you know, I, I, I just don't, you know, I just, it do, just doesn't do anything. for you got cat people, snake people, dog people. I'm not any of those. Watch the National Geographic a few times, and this, this I know about the snakes. If you're going to pick one up, if you're going to pick one up, you want to control the head. And if you grab the tail, you have not controlled the head. I was watching a video that Jacques sent me from Shikwaru, right out in front where, where we usually have our gatherings when all of the students come. There was about a 12-foot snake that had come out of the bush there. And, and this guy was, was walking around trying to position himself in the right place to jump in and grab the snake. And he would grab the tail from time to time, and the snake would extend. He was just trying to, I guess, lull the snake to sleep or get the snake ready for it. And then he was going to reach down and grab it just behind the head. This is another crazy person. There are a lot of them in the universe. I wouldn't go anywhere near that. I'll tell you this. I wouldn't grab the tail and pick it up. Some of you already are getting the heebie-jeebies because just about now that thing is going to strike and it's going to strike the hand that's holding the tail. Any act of obedience will be tested. When you've taken your step of faith, when you've laid down your dream or your talent or your plans, when you've given your gift, when you've paid your tithe, don't be surprised if God won't test you. Every step of faith I have ever taken under the leadership of the Holy Spirit Every step I've taken has been tested. I remember so well in the late 80s over on Jefferson Road, we finally got some momentum. We, we were about 
30 people and then we got to be about 40 people and 50 people and somewhere around 80 people we said we're going to have to have more room so we need to start thinking about building and by the time we were about 100 people we broke ground i'll never forget that day stepping out there just outside the front door and we had a shovel that somebody had spray painted gold and a whole nine yard had a bow on it i don't know why we do that but it had a big fluffy bow on it and I stood out there and everyone stood around and there are, I guess, about 50 people out there after service and, and jammed that shovel into the ground and we turned over a shovel of dirt and everybody said hallelujah and I, I remember that, oh, what a, great, what a great moment that was. We were started, it was probably about 1989, early 1989, we were, we were ready to launch, we were ready to go. Actually, it was 1988, it just clicked for me. It was 19, and we were so we were so excited, we were so excited, and so we got everything together, and we got the plans ordered up, and and everything was under production, and we were ready to we were ready to rock and roll, and not a single financier in Greensboro would talk to us. Our meetings were short and sweet. We'd sit down, they'd look at the balance sheet, and they'd say no. Churches weren't a good risk. Not at that point in time, especially a church with our balance sheet. If you've got 100 people attending the church, and back in those days, your membership was so much smaller. In those days, you had about 30 members, and they, they would look at the membership. They didn't look at who attended. They looked at the membership. And so they didn't judge you as a church of 100 or 150. They looked at your membership. And if your membership said 30, then you were dealt with as though you were a church of 30 because in the banker's mind, those are the, those are the people who will pay the pledges. Those are the people who are going to get the job done. And I can remember going bank to bank to bank with two elders. We went from one place to the other trying to get a loan, and it all shut down. Everything laid dormant for almost six months. And I remember, this, I remember the day that I went out. I took that same shovel by now. The bow had all kind of fallen apart and unraveled. And I grabbed that shovel. I went out in disgust. And I smoothed out the area where we had turned over the grass and hoped that grass would grow in the spring. I was so utterly disgusted. We were up against an incredible test. I wanted to give up. I really wanted to give up. A very influential voice in my life really challenged me with that. Do you think? Do you think maybe you've done what you can? Do you think maybe this is it? Do you think maybe it's time for you to step away? I remember wrestling with those things. But we stayed with it. And we walked faithfully. And the Lord gave us an answer that we never would have imagined. About three things all came together at once for this little church in whom it was impossible to find the resources. All of a sudden, we not only found the resource, but we were able to build. We were able to build in a reasonable fashion. We were able to build responsibly. It was, a, it was an incredible thing, and it all fell together at once. But the Lord first tested us. When we stepped out in faith to build this building, and we, we had been rolling like a juggernaut, I mean, we, we had just seen some incredible things happen between 1989 and 1999. We had seen some wonderful things happen, and, and Calvary was just, it was, it was rolling. Stepped out in faith to build this building. We already had the land. We paid this land off in 100 days. How many of you, very few of you were around back then to remember. How many of you remember us celebrating paying off the land? Lift your hands. Not many, huh? But we paid, we paid 27 acres off in 100 days. It was victory after victory after victory after victory. And so we got out here on the property and we broke ground. And almost to the day that we broke ground, almost to the day, the money started drying up. Giving started drying up. All of that forward progress that we made, we just saw that leaking away. And by now we had footings in. We had a million dollars in this building before we even put up a single piece of steel just in the pad and everything that went underneath and the drainage and the property. There was a million dollars that had gone right out and there was almost nothing to show for it. We erected some steel out here. We had these, the balcony steel was up and I remember so well. I remember so well the shock and the confusion, wondering what in the world is going on? What in the world have I got myself into? Moses, Moses was shocked. He ran away from his snake. I see Moses saying, I didn't sign up for this. 
A burning bush, that's one thing. That's, that's enough on my radar for one day. But a rod that gets turned into a snake, that puts me on emotional overload, and I just want to get away by myself. He heard the voice of God, and he got a snake. And the Lord said, take the snake by the tail. And I remember, well, a, that cold night we had held a board meeting just in the construction trailer that was just off, the, just off of the west lobby here, construction trailer. We had one room in there, and we were doing our board meetings there, just putting everyone on site so that we could do a building walkthrough and then do, do the board meeting and walk through all of the, uh, all of the numbers. And we had finished board meeting that night, and, and our giving numbers had not been very good at the church. As a matter of fact, they were in, they were in decline. I remember, it, I remember it was like yesterday. I remember the, the steps that I took. I remember Pierre Goria. Pierre Goria was the last deacon to leave, and I remember him getting into his truck and backing out the little gravel lane and on the road and driving away, and it was just me and Jesus and the skeleton of a building, cold night. I believe, I believe it was somewhere around late September or early October. And I locked up the trailer and I was about to go home when I decided I would come over and walk through this cavern. And I stepped up on a ladder and climbed up on the steel decking that they had laid down for the balcony up there and I let my, right over here on this southwest side, I let my feet hang over the edge and I just sat there, and it was a little bit spooky. There was a cold wind blowing, and the construction lights that had been set up on the corners were casting an eerie glow over the property. And I sat there, and all of my fears came to visit me. Every last one of them showed up. First, I wondered, and I, and honestly, I mean, this this showed this uh, this exposes pride. I guess I I remember thinking. I'm the guy that they're going to talk about someday in the North Carolina district. I'm the guy that they'll talk about among my brethren. I'm the guy, I'm the fool that they'll talk about who started down a road and was not prepared and must have made the wrong moves or messed it all up somewhere along the line. I'm going to wear this failure for the rest of my life. And it was, you say, well, that was a lie from the enemy. Yeah, of course it was. But have you ever been there where the lie sounded really true? And no matter how much you shouted at the lie, the lie just hung around. And you tried to think yourself into, into a, a right frame of mind and you told yourself to straighten up and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you, you preached a three-point message to yourself and had an altar call and no one came. I was sitting up there with my feet dangling over the edge looking out on this eerie just this eerie sight because there was a built-up mound here where the platform would eventually be and you could see at least the girdered outline of the building all the way around and we had some decking up, no walls. And I don't know exactly how it happened, but in that moment, I suddenly wasn't alone. I got up there and I told the Lord about how rotten it was and it wasn't working and the only message I could get from, from God at all was you're going to have to trust me with this. So I said, Lord, I'm going to have to trust you with this. And when I did, somehow God planted faith deep inside of me. And he reminded me of a text that I would preach not that much longer, a text that actually was birthed there that I preached in a venue I never imagined I would preach in. I preached those five words, I will build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the word the Lord gave me. And so I took the snake by the tail and lo and behold, I found it suddenly became manageable again. You see, when you release it to God and then walk in obedience and do what He says, the thing that you thought was wild and unmanageable and dangerous and deadly, suddenly it's within your hands. 
If you step out in faith, don't be surprised if you are tested. Don't be surprised if you throw down that trusted staff and it becomes a snake. And if God says, pick it up, then pick it up. It's a test. This is God. This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This is God. This is a test. I'm going to try you. I'm going to put you through some hard places. I'm going to, I'm going to make you do some things that maybe you didn't want to do in the first place. But if you'll walk with me, I'm going to show myself faithful to you. I'm going to unlock a door for you that you never even would have found. It's a test of faith. Take your trouble by the tail. God's going to make it into the instrument of your deliverance. Oh, and by the way, do you know, we moved into this building in 2003 took on all of all of this and uh, do you know how many payments we struggled to make with this building in the years since then and now I'm talking about from the first month until today never one never one we not only were able to pay what we were required to pay, but we've always paid more. God provided everything that we need. And when I was sitting up there alone, feeling like the world was coming to an end, he had it completely in his hand, and he was simply saying, trust me. Well, I've taken too long with that illustration, so we're at the, the last, last teaching point here, and we'll, we'll wrap up. Understand this, anything given to God must not be repossessed. Moses picked it up, but it was never again his. The rod of Moses was from that day forth known as the rod of God. It was recognized as belonging to God. It was a symbol of God's authority and God's power. And what God did with that dead stick... God used it at the focal point for his judgments and his miracles. The plagues came when God told Moses, stretch out the rod. Deliverance came through the Red Sea when God said, stretch out the rod. As long as it was God's, it was mightily used in Moses' hands. But later on, Moses repossessed it only for a moment. And it was disaster. It's a sad story. The people were in the wilderness and they were complaining. And Moses was fed up with them. And Moses was angry. And Moses wanted to teach them a lesson. And Moses and Aaron sought God as to what should be done for water. They needed water. And so they sought the Lord. And God gave them an answer. But they were angry. It's bad when the priest gets angry. It's bad when the prophet gets angry. It's bad when a pastor lives angry. Anyone who lives angry ultimately will make some terrible, terrible judgments and awful mistakes. And Moses and Aaron sought the Lord for what should be done. Now listen, Moses, this is the Numbers chapter 20. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Speak to the rock. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded them. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them. Notice what he says to them. It differs somewhat. Here's what God said. Say, take the staff, you and Aaron, tell the rock before their eyes, before your eyes, yield the water. Isn't that simple? So what do you do? You walk up and say, God has spoken to us and we're to speak to this rock. And so we speak to this rock and we tell this rock to yield up water. And that's what should happen. And all the people say, bless the Lord. And they go home. But no, Aaron and Moses, especially Moses, was ticked off. And Aaron and Moses gathered the assembly together. And he said to them, here now, you rebels. Shall we bring water out of this rock for you? And Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock with his staff twice. God's merciful. Listen, water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their livestock. And then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Moses, I took care of the people's need, but Moses, you didn't do what I said to do. 
And Moses, you made it seem as though it was your strength that was being demonstrated. And Moses, you told the people, you told the people, those stiff-necked people, that you were going to bring them water. Moses, you repossessed the staff. And Moses, from the very first time I told you to lay it down, it was never yours again. You want to know why Moses didn't go into the land? That's the story. That's the story. God didn't say strike the rock twice. Moses wasn't supposed to take personal credit, nor was he supposed to vent his anger. He decided to freelance, and it cost him the promised land. What you surrender to God never repossess. The moment you give it to God, it's no longer yours. It's his. How many of you have done some repossessing in your time? My God, help me. This is his church. There have been times I've forgotten and I thought it was my church. And without fail, when I start treating it as, as though it's my church, it begins to dysfunction. All that we have, all he's placed in our hands, if we will surrender it, if we will act as though it is his and not ours, God will bless it. But if we hold it as though it is our own, it will only be met by frustration. I came upon a quote reading a book by an author who's my dad's favorite as a preacher, and he's become one of mine through the years. His name's J. Stuart Holden, and dad's on my mind a lot, and I find myself, it's almost nostalgic. I'll either listen to a CD of his preaching or a tape of his preaching from time to time, or I'll pull down books. I know that he loved sermons that he's marked out in some of those books, and I pulled a Holden off the shelf, and I was reading through the Holden, and dad had underlined a couple of things. And I came upon this paragraph Holden wrote that Moses should be overwhelmed at the magnitude of the task committed to him gives us no cause for wonder. Knowing so much of Egypt and so little of God as he did at the time, it's not difficult to imagine nor to justify the reluctance to confront Pharaoh. One line came right off the page for me. Knowing so much of Egypt and so little of God. Is that where God finds us this morning? Knowing so much about life and so little about God. Knowing so much of our problems and so little about God. Knowing so much of our history and so little about God. So much about Egypt, so little about God. Listen, what is in your hand? Lay it down. Do what he says. Let him use it in power. Never be anything less than a fully surrendered vessel, and whatever you give him, never take it back. And God will use you. He will use you in ways that you would never imagine. Father, we come before you this day, and we ask you to hear the cry of our heart. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive us for those things that we have taken up again and repossessed as though they're ours. Forgive us, Lord, when we've been faithless. Forgive us, Lord, when the school of hard knocks has ruled and reigned in such a way over our lives that we've refused to take steps of faith. Help us, Lord, to re-engage. Some of us have been hurt along the way. Some have been wounded and deeply bruised. Some of us have lost confidence in our own ability to hear your voice. Lord, I pray that you would take us back to a place of primal faith, a place of simplicity, a, faith of, a place of, of hope. I pray, Lord, that you would do a new thing in us. Do a new thing through us for your glory.